how to see what's going on around you. So here we are at Bowton House, our new home, and it's good, isn't it? Everything's different. We're looking left, we're looking right, we're looking all around. Trees and fields as far as the eye can see. Bunting and tents and people. It's a feast for the eyes. Look, there's the allotment gallery, and there are all the stalls with the silly hats. Oh, look at that lovely view of the lake through those trees. Look at how they've done the signs this year and all the little lights. They look nice. See over here, they've got a climbing wall. And look, there's so and so we met last year. Sorry, but I must just have a quick look at the toilets. It's like moving house, moving into a new neighborhood. We look around at everything, seeing how much nicer the area is, what landmarks to tell our friends and family when giving them directions to the new house, the different things that we can see on our new commute to work. We notice everything. We're seeking reference points and looking for detail, using our eyes like a camera to imprint images on our brains. It's that sense of curiosity, a consciousness in our looking, an awareness of our surroundings, a capturing of detail. And how much is this true in our everyday lives? How often do we really look at things? How much do we miss? When did you last really look at the bark of a tree? For one minute, for two minutes, for five minutes? Or sit and count the number of different shades of green that you can see in the trees and the hedges in front of you? Have you ever followed the line of the road as you sit on the bus, mentally drawing a line of the curves and the bends, the straights, the parallels? Or studied the collection of objects on your desk in front of you? How they are arranged, the outline of their combined shadow on your desk? Do you look at the patterns on railings and gates? Or consciously, deliberately find faces and alphabet shapes in everyday objects? And when did you last consciously walk down the high street and gaze at the architectural details above the all too generic shop fronts below? Once we've lived anywhere for a while, walked the dog in the same park for a few years, done the daily commute a thousand times, we stop looking. The cognitive scientist Alexander Horowitz puts it like this. We summarize and generalize, stop looking at particulars, and start taking in scenes at a glance, all in an effort not to be overwhelmed visually when we just need to make it through the day. It seems that much of the time we are tunnel visioned, visually and mentally on autopilot, simply going about our daily business. In his book Ways of Seeing, the art critic, poet, writer John Berger states, The visible has been and still remains the principal human source of information about the world. It's all about choice. We only see what we look at. To look is an act of choice. We never look at just one thing. We are always looking at the relationship between things and ourselves. The human race has always been visual. Primitive cultures painted images on the walls of caves. Images became symbols and hieroglyphs and mark making and alphabets, and thus we learned to write. And through the generations, artists continued to help us make sense of the world visually. And by the 15th century, when Gutenberg's printing press made books readily available to the masses, our dominant sense truly became vision for reading. In educational terms, reading and writing is known as literacy. Our ability to communicate and make sense of language and words. You might not be aware, but there are now considered to be lots of literacies emotional literacy, digital literacy, and yes, even visual literacy how we read the world, how we understand and communicate and make sense of all the visual messages going on around us. Being visual can be a learning style. Some of us are visual learners. We learn best by being shown something or by reading about it. Some are auditory learners, learning by being told how to do something or hearing information. Others, kinesthetic learners, who learn best only when they physically do something. And many, of course, are a combination of all three. It even comes out in our language. We all use visual phrases to express ourselves. I see what you mean. Look at it from my perspective. 
Yes, I can picture that. Look at it this way. That's not how I see things. And have you noticed how many politicians today answer almost every question with, look, a device to encourage you to see things their way? Advances in technology have made us even more visual. TV and video and cinema, photography, advertising, branding, computers, websites, games, infographics. We're visually plugged into technology all the time. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Vine, selfies. We have access to an almost limitless amount of visual information and stimuli, and the ability to experience the world and look at everything through the screens on our smartphones. We're now even more likely to take a quick photo, believing that we might look at it properly later, instead of stopping and consciously looking there and then, fully present in the moment. And how many times do we look at our phones in any day? What else do we look at that regularly, that repeatedly? In the days when a mobile phone still had an external aerial and looked like a brick, I was a secondary school art teacher. The first project I would do with Year Seven students would always be a pencil-drawn self-portrait, getting them to look at their clo、uh, faces closer, study themselves in the mirror, consider where their eyes were in relation to their nose, and so on. Learning how to draw line and shape, shading and tone. It was an exercise in concentration and observation. They would spend almost twice as much time looking as drawing, getting to know their own face. Something they had lived with and seen every day for 11 years, but seemingly had never really looked at. It's probably fair to say that taking a selfie doesn't develop quite the same skills in observation and concentration. Can you teach someone to draw? Absolutely. It often simply starts by teaching them how to look. If it doesn't come naturally, like everything in life, it just takes practice. Practice in looking. You see, artists really do see the world differently. The painter Cezanne looked at nature in terms of geometric forms like spheres, cylinders, cones, and cubes, and he explored different perspectives. He wrote, "Painting is first and foremost an optical affair. The stuff of our art is there in what our eyes are thinking." Van Gogh painted the ordinary and the everyday, like agricultural labourers, his own bedroom, his friend's chair, choosing to see beauty in what was missed by others. I see drawings and paintings in the poorest of huts and the dirtiest of corners, he said. But what if you're not an artist? Well, you used to be. You've just forgotten how to be one. Picasso famously said, "Every child is an artist." The problem is how to remain an artist when we grow up. Children are naturally curious, full of wonder. Before they can speak or write, they will scribble and draw and respond to visual stimuli. They are completely unselfconscious. Why do they openly stare at people, especially those who perhaps look a little different? What is it that they see in the cardboard box when all we see is packaging to be thrown away? How can they watch a caterpillar or a ladybird for so long? It seems we all start out as artists, but eventually we stop staring. We become self-conscious. We stop drawing. We become less curious. We grow up. The challenge, well summarised by artist and writer Kerry Smith: always be looking. Everything is interesting. Look closer. Observe for long durations and short ones. Notice patterns. Make connections. So perhaps, encouraged by Picasso, we should reclaim our childhood curiosity, be more like Cezanne, and let our eyes do the thinking, and like Van Gogh, consciously look for unseen beauty in the ordinary, the everyday, the dirty, the broken. Let's allow our eyes to save images on the camera roll in our brains, and why not practice looking by drawing in a sketchbook? It's all about choice. We only see what we look at. Thank you.